Hello, this is Jens Orfakis on behalf of DiEM25, our Democracy in Europe movement, with some thoughts about the impact of the, what else, the epidemic, not just on our daily lives and our health, but primarily on our economy, on our politics, on our morality, on the way we deal with um, um, asymmetric or symmetric threats. This epidemic, like all epidemics, has these two separate but of course related uh, realms. One is the impact on our health, on the way it um, changes our lives with isolation, with the cessation of normal activities, the fear of uh, illness, but at the same time there is the epidemic that spreads throughout the political economy of global capitalism. Undoubtedly the coronavirus is going to accelerate the post-2008 crisis. Now, don't let anyone tell you that that crisis ended and now we have a new one. The 2008 crisis never ended. It morphed into different forms. Uh, it traveled from one continent to another. It took different forms. But nevertheless, it has always been with us. The world never went back to some kind of equilibrium after 2008. Capitalism is uh, unrecognizable today by means of terms of references from the period before 2008. What the coronavirus has done is it has deepened and accelerated the never-ending non-stop crisis that began in 2008. If you think about it, the reason why there's been a semblance of normality, of recovery after 2010-2011 was because central banks and governments took it upon themselves to refloat the financial markets and to rebuild the circuits of financialized capital by printing uh, trillions and trillions, mountain ranges of money, and throwing them at the 0.1% at corporations that were already full of money. Take Apple, Google, and so on, uh, borrowing free money from the Federal Reserve in the United States, for instance, in order to buy back their own shares. All that that was doing was boosting inequality massively, stabilizing financial markets, but at the same time depleting all serious investment in good quality jobs, in labor, in health, in education, in the green transition that this planet needs. This is why there's been so much discontent even before COVID-19 arrived on the scene. So when COVID-19 arrived on the scene, uh, it found a global capitalism that was sitting on a gigantic bubble of private debt that had been minted by central banks on behalf of financial capital. So the problem is not stock exchanges going up and down. Every catastrophic collapse of the stock exchange can easily be followed by a remarkable uh, boost, uh, you know, the indices going through the roof. But even if the central banks of the world, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, even if they manage to refloat capitalism again in the same way that they did in, they did in 2008, 2009, uh, that is not going to bring us to where we were before COVID-19. And that is so for a very, very simple reason. COVID-19 has pricked the bubble on which financial capitalism was sitting up until now. So even if the financial markets are recorded once more, uh, the level of investment is going to be even lower than it was a few months ago. And let us not forget that a few months ago, the level of investment, especially in important stuff in things that humanity needs, tangible goods, um, green energy and so on, the level of investment in relation to the available liquidity and savings has never been lower than it was even before the coronavirus hit. Imagine what it will be like afterwards. Now what defenses does uh, financialized capitalism have today compared to 2008? This comparison is quite instructive between 2008 and 2020. In 2008, Two things saved global capitalism. The Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, and China. Of course, later governments in Europe, uh, the International Monetary Fund and so on, uh, did much in order to complete the job that the Fed and China began by shifting cynically gigantic amounts of losses from the private banks onto the shoulders of the weakest taxpayers what we in DiEM25 refer to as socialism for the very, very few, for the bankers, and the harsh austerity for the many. 
But it was China and the Fed that were the pillars that kept financial capitalism going. Both these pillars are today highly depleted. Coronavirus started in China. It uh, damaged significantly the uh, capacity of the Chinese political economy to produce surpluses. It shut down factories. Uh, it reduced the growth rate below zero. And therefore, it did exactly the opposite to China uh, compared to what happened with the financial crisis in 2008. China is not today in a position to do what, it, what needs to be done in order to boost aggregate demand in Germany, in Holland, in Japan, in the United States. China is a patient now. It is not the medical provider. The Federal Reserve could potentially repeat that magnificent feat of 2009 because unbeknownst to many people, in 2009 the Federal Reserve extended what is called in the business dollar swap lines to the European Central Bank and to the Bank of Japan and to the Bank of England and to many other central banks. Effectively, the Federal Reserve said to them, we will give you as many dollars as you need in order to cover your positions, your bets in dollars that had gone up in the air. Trillions of dollars were provided by the Federal Reserve to the inane ridiculous bankers of Germany, of France, of Greece, of Japan, and so on and so forth, and therefore refloated them. They could do this again now. Uh, but there are two problems. First, as I said before, this is not going to restore the capacity of capitalism to invest in important things and in good quality jobs. That capacity is going to be lessened, even from the ridiculously low levels that we had before the coronavirus hit. Uh, but there is another problem. It's called Donald Trump in the White House. Will Mr. Trump uh, sit idly by watching the Federal Reserve provide swap lines to Germany, to the European Central Bank, to Japan, to China, if needs be? I very much fear that he's going to, to try to uh, attach strings to any such uh, dollar swaps. And if you do try to attach strings and to try to use this as a negotiating tool with the European Union or with China, those strings destroy the efficacy of the dollar swap lines. It sounds like a technical issue. It's not a technical issue. It's, uh, it's quite a question of brute force. In 2008, 2009, the Federal Reserve used the exorbitant privilege of having the capacity to issue dollars in order to save uh, financial capital um, in the rest of the world. Is Donald Trump interested in doing that? If he's not interested in doing that, the repercussion would be very simple. We're going to have an even deeper crisis, a deeper recession with tangible effects on the lives of people from, um, from Hong Kong and Shanghai all the way to Finland, Portugal, um, Iceland, everywhere. This is why this epidemic is of great significance to real people's lives across the world. If there are any lessons to be learned from this latest uh, development in the global political economy, uh, it is twofold. Firstly, the importance of public health systems. And secondly, how crucial it is to use public finance for the benefit of the many, not the few. I'll begin with public health. Have you noticed? that uh, private health providers resemble the rats that are jumping off the sinking ship. Have you heard anything being discussed regarding the contribution of private hospitals and private health care during this crisis of uh, the coronavirus-induced uh, dynamic? No. They are nowhere to be seen. All the discussion in the media, the very same media that before the coronavirus hit were going on and on about private-public partnerships and how important it is uh, to um, you know, push money towards uh, private health care because that's more efficient than public health care. That's the, uh, the narrative of um, the privileged, if you want, which dominated for so many years, decades, in the West after Thatcher and Reagan. The very same media that were extolling the 
virtues of privatization of hospitals or private public partnerships and so on today only talk about the importance of um, uh, utilizing the public health service in order to save our bacon to save our lives and to ameliorate the effects from the coronavirus i'm going to make a very strong statement i'm not just going to say that private health care is inefficient no it's not just that they are inefficient they are destructive every euro every yen every dollar which is being spent on private health services detracts not only does not add enough but detracts from the capacity of humanity to deal with pandemics it is about time we eradicate private health service there is no even a liberal argument in favor of private health insurance of private health systems they do not work even by the standards of liberal economic pro-capitalist, pro-market thinking. And then there is, of course, fiscal policy. It is interesting that even uh, the Federal Reserve, especially the European Central Bank, under its new president, Christine Lagarde, who, by the way, uh, gets a score of precisely zero out of her first attempt to intervene um, in, a few days ago with a press conference in order to steady the nerves of the markets and uh, to show that the European Central Bank will do whatever it takes in order to save, again, the euro's bacon and to stabilize the economy. She failed spectacularly. She made two graphs. I'm not going to go into them. Close the parenthesis on this. Even she, nevertheless, came out and said, look, our ammunition as a central bank has been spent over the last 10 years. She didn't use those words, but that's what she meant. Um, we have refloated financial markets. There's nothing we can do. Think about it. They, it the European Central Bank has a negative interest rate of minus 0.5%. It keeps buying all sorts of um, debt, private debt, public debt, and so on. Um, it is at the end of its tether. And she, on behalf of uh, the extremely conservative European Central Bank, uh, looked at prime ministers and presidents of the eye and said, it's your job now to borrow and spend. And what are they doing? It is astonishing. The other day there was um, a Eurogroup meeting, the meeting of the European Union's finance ministers of the countries that are using the euro. And uh, it was a teleconference. They decided that the coronavirus poses a clear and present danger of a massive recession in Europe, that it is a highly significant threat to European economies. So much so, the urgency was so great that they decided to do no absolutely nothing. They decided that they are going to monitor the situation, that they're going to be watched. You see, what happens is the Eurogroup and uh, the European Union, and in particular the Eurozone, is so terribly structured that um, they, they are on autopilot. They simply follow particular rules that cannot be followed without wrecking our economies. This is not just a reflection of inanity, it is that as well, but it is a reflection of a system that has been created in order to prevent governments from acting on behalf of society. That is, if you want, the neoliberal kernel inside the Eurogroup. Uh, they are talking about doing whatever it takes within the fiscal compact, which means nothing, because the fiscal compact is like uh, an iron cage of austerity from which you cannot escape. And you need to escape from an iron cage of austerity if you're going to do anything about the green transition, which is so essential, or uh, about dealing with the wholesale recession that the coronavirus is going to bring again to a Europe that has fallen behind the rest of the world as a result of such a stringent austerity package that began in Greece uh, in 2010 and then spread out like a cancer out of control throughout the European Union. So let's recap. We live in a world which is not governed in a way that um, allows us to see any light at the end of the tunnel regarding uh, the handling of capitalism's uh, never-ending crisis which the coronavirus has now turbocharged. The European Union has never been less competent than it is now. The European Union has never been less capable of acting as a union than it is now. DiEM25's proposals over the last four years since our inception about uh, a common investment policy 
based on an alliance between our investment bank, the European Investment Bank, the European Central Bank, about a universal basic dividend, about um, a carbon tax, and about a social equity fund, the purpose of which will be to energize both private capital and public finance or public financial instruments in order to take the mountain ranges of liquidity that exist in our financial circuits and put it into good use, press them into public service in terms of public health, in terms of the green transition, in terms of creating good quality jobs. That agenda of DiEM25 has never been more pertinent and has never been more urgent than today. So we can see that all the arguments of the liberal establishment, effectively business as usual, um, it took one little virus in order to wreck them. We've seen that the idea of Lexit, of a left-wing exit from the European Union, all it did was uh, it strengthened people like Boris Johnson and the right-wing exiteers, the nationalists, the ones who want to build taller walls between our countries and the ones who are benefiting politically by turning one proud nation against another, another one person against another, one um, member of the working class uh, against another member of the working class. We have seen the inability of existing nation-state-based political parties to come together and to issue um, a common manifesto, a common policy agenda for the whole of the European Union. DiEM25 is the only one that has done it. We did have our Green New Deal. We do have it. The Green New Deal can very easily be seen as the only foundation on which we can build simultaneously the uh, investment in the green transition, which is essential in order to keep us breathing on this planet, and the public health services that are essential for dealing with a pandemic like this one. On behalf of uh, DiEM25, carpet diem as we say, the world is going to become a worse place very, very soon, but it is up to us to fight um, in the context of a transnational movement like what DiEM25 is um, building in Europe, like what the Progressive International is doing across the world. We'll have more to say about this later on, especially in September, when we reconvene the Progressive International in Reykjavik in Iceland. It is essential that we keep struggling because our ideas and our blueprint make sense, they are rational, they are immediately implementable. All we need to do is to change the politics of a continent, Europe, that is finding it impossible to reproduce itself under the present circumstances without the fundamental, profound, transnational, progressive politics that we advocate as DiEM25. Thank you.